Hey, happy Friday. Annoying disclaimer right off the bat. If there is like a whine in the background that I can't completely isolate, just know that it is my radiators and it is annoying me just as much as you. Yes, I do enjoy being warm and comfortable in the winter, but also I'm fairly sure this is the first time they've turned on all day, so. I don't know. Either way, if you're like me, this is the first full week back at work after the holidays, and I definitely wanted something kind of light and fun to help ease me back into that mental place. And luckily for me, Talia Hibbert came out with her first young adult, highly suspicious and unfairly cute, last week. So this is kind of the opposite of the trend I've been noticing of a lot of young adult authors that kind of came up when I was heavily reading in young adult, moving to adult spaces. People like last week's Rachel Hawkins, Emily Henry, Ashley Poston, these people that are really carving out a space for themselves within adult spheres and adult genre fiction. And so here we have a popular adult romance author moving in to young adult spaces. And I think that Hibbert's voice is perfectly primed for young adult, and I was admittedly at the same time a little unsure going into this, because Hibbert's books are admittedly pretty spicy. There is a heat level there, and that heat level really helps balance out the quirk and the charm and the banter that exist in her worlds. So conceivably the heat level is going to be much more reined in here, which it was, and I was unsure if that would throw off the balance of things. And the good news is, I don't think it did. This, unsurprisingly, probably if you've read Hibbert's work before, like The Brown Sisters, and if you liked The Brown Sisters and enjoyed young adult, I think this is going to be 100% up your alley. Or if you're like me, a millennial, and have read things like Meg Cabot, Angus Thongs and Full Frontal Snogging, the kind of early E. Lockhart novels, this feels like of the same vein. And I admittedly haven't been reading a whole lot in the young adult romance sphere as I've gotten older, just because it does feel more distant to me. But there are still these titles that peek through, peak my interest, and both connect me to the young reader I used to be, and remind me of that charm and that heart, and also what I think young adults and young readers gravitate toward. When I was subbing, granted it was only a year and I was in and out of classes of all ages, but when I was in the middle school especially, and this was kind of at the height of paranormal fantasy young adult, even amidst that being the most popular on things like blogs, because it was still the blog era, in school I saw people picking up things like Anna and the French Kiss and, you know, other young adult romances. And so this feels very much in that vein. There is this quirk, there is this heart, there is this banter, and it really feels true to the reality of teens now, while also giving a little bit of escapism. For instance, one of our protagonists, Celine, is big on TikTok, and that feels very true to where teens are at today and meets them where they're at. And I feel like there can be this kind of hesitancy to meet teens where they're at because things are moving so quickly. Your novel can feel dated with things like that or references like that so quickly. But I think that there is a real joy in discovering and seeing the world as you experience it, but also with these little avenues of escapism in it. There is a reason Gossip Girl was so popular when I was a teenager and I don't think it was the writing because I did not enjoy the writing. I've only read the first one, but it was inescapable even before it was a TV show. And I think that that kind of young adult landscape was a if you know, you know, and that has undoubtedly dated, even though they have released updated covers, I believe. I'm sure those novels feel very mid 2000s because they were written for teens in the mid 2000s and met them where they were at, although admittedly in this heightened way. But we've moved from things like princesses or models being aspirational, although still aspirational, to things like influencers. So here we have a main character who is an influencer, but that still doesn't make her popular. And we see that mirrored from a lot of the young adult that I really enjoyed as a teen. And it's this kind of double life, double identity persona that's popular across different forms of storytelling. I'm looking at you, Hannah Montana, although I was of the Lizzie McGuire generation, and I don't think I've ever seen a full episode of Hannah Montana. So anyway, I think that this is a great hook for teen readers especially, and it's just a fun little element regardless, but it is not the kind of overarching standout element. It's just a given circumstance rather than the main driver of the novel. The main driver of the novel is this kind of antagonistic relationship between Celine and Bradley, our two leads here. We get both of their points of view, which if you 
you've been here a second, you know I love in a romance. And here we have a friends to enemies to lovers situation that is heightened by academic rivalry, which is just like chef's kiss. A good academic rivalry has so much charge to it, and here we really get to see them butt heads, and they know that the other is smart. And so they're kind of able to verbally spar at a different level. And I love that everyone at school kind of knows that they're enemies as well, but there's also this sense that maybe there's something else going on. So our leads are Celine and Bradley, and Celine, as I stated, is a popular kind of conspiracy theorist TikToker. She likes to dig into conspiracy theories and unpack them, but this, as stated, hasn't made her super popular at school, especially because she's kind of abrasive. She has this real shield up and this outer layer to protect herself because her father left when she was younger and she doesn't enjoy letting people in. And this protective layer has been exacerbated because she was very close to Bradley. And then Bradley, as he was kind of figuring out his own mental health journey, and he had just been recently diagnosed with OCD and joined sports to kind of help ground him and give him another outlet. And we'd gotten the idea too that he'd been kind of tasked by his therapist to broaden his social circle because he was so enmeshed with Celine and Celine only. And Celine took him kind of broadening his social circle as him abandoning her. Meanwhile, he watched her withdraw and pull away and took that as an abandonment and thus they butt heads. And so that's kind of our given circumstance. And while Celine has this kind of tougher, spikier exterior, which is not uncommon for a Hibbert heroine, Bradley is a little bit more of a gold and retriever and Celine kind of just brings out the spiky parts of him. And so they end up getting thrown together more via circumstance and this kind of leadership developmental opportunity. Celine really wants this opportunity because her hero is leading it and it's going to open up so many doors in terms of future career paths for her. She thinks it's going to look great on college applications. And even though she hasn't said it out loud at the beginning of the novel, a lot of her career ambitions are being kind of spurred on by her desire desire to make her father see her and to regret his abandonment of her and to kind of outshine him in his own field. So she's interested in going into law, but she's looking at corporate law, even though that's not where her heart really lies, because that is what her father practices. Meanwhile, Bradley is also looking to go into law, and this is another kind of tension point between the two, although he actually secretly dreams of being an author. He loves reading especially science fiction and fantasy via the books we see him reading in the novel, and he's got great taste based on those books as well. But he's kind of fallen into this trap of following in his father's footsteps and his father being so excited for that. And Bradley is both unsure of his own artistic abilities and his ability to make it as an author because he is very aware of the realities of what it means to be an author and the chances of success as an author. And he just doesn't want to let his father down because he knows he can practice law, he's capable of it, and he sees how happy that makes his father. And so he stumbles across this opportunity and looks at it as a way to get a scholarship and be able to study on his own because living with others with his OCD is not optimal for his mental health. So he thinks that he can get a place by himself if he gets a scholarship. And so of course this puts Bradley and Celine in direct competition. And not only is this just a leadership retreat or extracurricular activity, but it's basically like camping retreats. They are sent away on school breaks for these kind of activities in the forest where they're set to do teamwork exercises and accomplish goals of collecting like things hidden in the woods and meeting these final goals and they're being assessed the entire time. So naturally Bradley and Celine already don't like each other and they have these major drivers that are creating real stakes for why they want to succeed in this as well as they are both really high achieving individuals and the idea of failure doesn't sit well with either either of them anyway. But through these programs, they are reminded of how well they know each other. They're able to get under each other's skin partly because of their long history and they know each other's buttons, but they're still willing to back each other up where it matters. And through these expeditions, their walls start to come down and we get to see them kind of discover themselves in new ways outside of the boundaries of their school ecosystem. So we see Bradley is already a very likable individual. He can get people on his side and like him very easily and not through artifice or manipulation. He's just a really likable guy. Meanwhile, we see Celine kind of struggle with that. 
because she knows she kind of struggles with that. But we get to see her make friends too and kind of struggle against that voice that wants to push people away to protect herself. So this is undoubtedly a romance and the romance between Bradley and Celine is a main driver, especially in terms of structure, the way the whole novel is conceived. But as I think any good young adult romance does, it really also is about these young people discovering themselves within the wider world and about kind of stepping into themselves, learning who they are, who they want to be, and moving forward with that and making decisions for their future. And as these characters are looking toward their very immediate future, they're looking forward to university, the novel also doesn't kind of shy away from the fact that there is a timeline to these things. One of the main things keeping them apart at a certain point of the novel is Celine's fear of the future and that once they go away to university, Bradley will make all of these friends and he won't want her anymore and that will hurt too much. And so I loved with Celine especially watching these protective barriers come down, but also watching Bradley who doesn't have as many kind of stereotypical protective barriers up within the novel, his barriers come down as well and how Celine can recognize those barriers. And so the character work here is delightful. Hibbert's characters are always a lot of fun and I think that these are the perfect kind of young adult iterations of those characters. I think if you liked the Brown sisters, you will love Celine especially, as I said. And I think the banter here is really top notch. Obviously, Miles may vary in terms of banter and everyone's kind of sweet spot with banter. And like I said, it's kind of hard with Hibbert because generally the banter in her novels feel like the lead up to other things. And here, we're not gonna get other things in the same way that we get in an adult Hibbert romance. And we don't get that. We get lots of making out, but it's usually referred to as past making out. We do get some present making out, but there's always gonna be a door that closes at a certain point. And so in some ways that banter is not gonna have the same kind of release valve that it has in an adult Hibbert novel. So it has to be navigated slightly differently. It's still the same voice. The characters still feel age appropriate within that voice, but the maneuvering is a little Bit different. And so here, like with adult Hibbert novels, the banter really is kind of the shield for our characters or our characters' shields to protect themselves. And I think that here especially we see that as a form of control as well, especially for young adults who feel like they have so little control over their lives at times. It's a way to kind of assert that control, bring that control into your life. And I think that that's how it is being utilized here. We see that banter kind of change tone and soften as our characters change. It's still humorous, but the banter loses some of its sharpness. And I think it's done really seamlessly because there were times I worried that the banter would kind of overshadow the rest of the novel but I don't think it did. I think that Hibbert has a really masterful balance of how much banter is both humor and how much is vulnerability. Oftentimes banter can be used to hide vulnerability and Hibbert doesn't shy away from that or lose sight of that in terms of letting us see a little bit more of that vulnerability on the other side, whether it's later in the narrative, on the other side of a specific moment or what have you. It never feels like we're lost to the fact that there's something else going on beyond the banter at face value, no matter how fun it is. But also the banter is a great indicator for how well matched our leads are to each other. They're able to meet each other exactly where they're at. They're able to keep up and they're able to get one up on one another. And so in many ways that verbal sparring, that meeting of the minds is a reward in a way. And in kind of the same vein as that banter, our protagonists are almost annoyed at how attracted they are to the other. Unfairly cute is very apt there. There's this kind of sense of this fight against the inevitable because they are so well matched. But at the same time, like I said, it never ignores the future. As I've gotten older, my idea of a happily ever after in a young adult romance has warped and shifted. And leaving that happy for now kind of door open feels like the most comfortable place for me as a reader, knowing that our characters are happy and fulfilled in the moment, knowing there are no clouds on the horizon, but also knowing that people change so much and that forever isn't always the reality in these young relationships, but that it doesn't make the happy right now mean any less. And I do think that that is balanced really well here. Now, that being said, the structure of this did throw me a little bit because I did expect it to be really focused 
on these camping expeditions, basically. And I do love that we got a sense of school life for them, normal life for them. Additionally, I did enjoy that we only got like one half of the expedition group. There were other explorers that were kind of outside of our purview and we knew that, but we were so focused on one, the character work between Celine and Bradley, and two, getting to know the characters we did get to know. And I think having the space to build that ensemble was really nice. That being said, I think that there was less camping than I anticipated. Now, don't get me wrong, there was still plenty of camping, but I think that there was just less of that angle than I expected. We really were focused on Bradley and Celine's emotional journeys, personal journeys, their journey together as a couple. Additionally, for being such overachievers, when they were put together in these leadership scenarios, it really stressed me out, especially as a former overachiever myself, because when put together, they both kind of lost all of their good sense, which to be fair, was the point, but I was like, you guys are gonna screw this up for both of you. Neither of you are gonna get what you want if you keep this up. And there were times that I almost found myself kind of viewing things more from the point of view of the chaperones on these trips. I was like, how would I have scored these two? Granted, we didn't see everything they got up to. We got just a slice of both expeditions. So that being said, there was slightly less camping than I expected. However, I do think that the novel was really expertly structured around that whole program. That was our, you know, change of circumstances, our inciting incident. It was what changed our characters' worlds enough to help them make different choices, to change their worldviews, to lose some of their inhibitions. And getting away from the normal everyday, day-to-day, -day, school, what have you, helped to lower some of those inhibitions as well. So if you like young adult romance, if you like Hibbert, if you like friends to enemies to lovers, if you like banter, if you like that meeting of the minds, if you like academic rivalries, because there is some heat to some academic rivalries sometimes, I think this will be right up your alley. So if you've read this, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the kind of shift from adult romance to young adult romance, how you think this fits within Hibbert's canon. I definitely feel like it is in line with the Brown Sisters series, as I said, but I've not read Hibbert's entire body of work yet, so I can't speak to the full breadth of it. But let me know what you're thinking. Thanks for listening to my thoughts. Thanks for hanging out read something good, like and subscribe if you feel like it, and yeah, bye.